Welcome to the first part of our week two video lecture on considerations for building a database. Please remember that this video presentation is copyrighted. An entity represents a single topic of importance that should be represented in the database. We represent an entity by one table. A relation is a table consisting of rows and columns. To be considered a relation, the table must have certain characteristics. Take a look at these eight characteristics of a relation. Rows must contain data about an entity, while columns contain data about the attributes of the entity. All cells in the table can only hold a single value. All entries in a column must be of the same kind. Every column must have a unique name and the order of the rows and columns is unimportant. Finally, no two rows may be identical. Now let's take a look at some examples of tables that are and that are not relations. Here's an example of a table that is a relation containing employee information. Notice how it meets all the criteria of a relation. The rows contain data about the entity, employees. The columns each contain data about the attributes of employee information. This, this column contains employee number. This column contains employee name. This column contains employee last name. All column entries are of the same type. Again, the only thing in this column, employee numbers. The only thing in this column, employee first name. The only thing in this column, the last name. Now let's take a look at an example that's not a relation. This table violates the characteristic that all cells may only contain one single value. Here we have two phone numbers listed in one single cell. Here's another example of a table that's not a relation. This table has two rows that are exactly the same. One for Abernathy here and one for Abernathy here. As we begin discussing databases, please note that these terms are often used interchangeably. Don't be confused if someone uses one term and you are accustomed to another term. They are synonyms. All of our tables must contain a column that is used as a key. This is how we identify the rows of the table. Composite keys contain more than one attribute. That is to say, they are made up of more than one column. This is sometimes necessary to create a key that is unique. A candidate key is a unique key that could possibly be chosen as the primary key for the table. The primary key is the key used to identify each individual row in the table. Please be sure you have read my lecture on the desirable characteristics of primary keys since that will help you determine the best primary key for a table. A surrogate key is an added value to a table. It has no meaning in the table aside from its role in identifying rows. It's a very common practice to use a surrogate key to avoid primary keys. When tables are related to each other, we must create a foreign key. This is the primary key from one table that is added to the table to which it is related. This is how we link one table to another. Please note that it's only called a foreign key in the table to which it was added, not the table in which it is the primary key. Look at this example. The department ID is the primary key for department, since this is how we identify the rows of the data in department. However, in the employee table, it is referred to as the foreign key because its function is to relate the employee table to the department table right here. This concludes part one of our video lecture for week two. Thank you for your attention. Hi there, welcome back to our second segment of our video lecture for this week. In this segment I would like to um, illustrate a few of the concepts that we covered in the first segment of our video lecture. Um, I've made a little database here of pets and their veterinarians. Um, in this database I have two tables. 
Both of these tables are relations. If you'll look here, this fits all the criteria that we mentioned it takes to make a relation. And in our pets table, we also have a relation that fits all the criteria. I'd like to point out a couple of things in this table. First of all, I have had questions from students. If you'll notice here, we have the pet vet ID of two on max and of two on spot. Um, I've had students question whether this violated the criteria that you can't have duplicate data on more than on two two or more rows of a database. Um, this data is just one piece of data. The, the criteria means you can't have the entire row duplicated. So this is a relation. Just because this is duplicated does not stop it from being a relation since we know that in many instances there will have to be duplicates of certain pieces of the information because obviously a vet will be taking care of more than one pet. Okay. Um, another thing I'd like to point out is notice here while we have the pet ID and the pet name, then we have the pet owner last name, the pet owner first name, then we go to the pet vet ID, and now we're back to information about the pet owner, the pet owner email. Um, this is perfectly fine. In the previous section of the video, we spoke about the fact that it doesn't matter the order that the rows or columns are in, and this is a perfect example of that. The reason it doesn't matter is because most databases are far too large to look at just through the database like this. We would query them using SQL, which we will cover in a, another week, and that's how we would find the information we want. So it doesn't matter really what order this is in. Okay, so that's perfectly okay. Now, let's look at a couple of things here. I want to create my relationships between them. I'll go to Database Tools and Relationships. And I want both of my tables here to add there. Okay. Ooh, first I have to, sorry, I have to close my table before it's going to let me add that. Okay, now, the first thing I want to do is to make my relation. And in doing that, I'm also going to create a foreign key. Remember we said that a foreign key is how we relate one um table to another. So I want to relate my pets table to my veterinarian's table. Okay? So I'm going to and again remember from last week's video, we can do this very simply by dragging. There we go. And now I have my vet ID and my pet vet ID. Remember from last week we do want to enforce referential integrity so that we don't end up with a a foreign key in a table that has no matching um, row in another table. All right, so I created my relationship here. Okay, now vet ID is the primary key here. Pet ID is the primary key for our pet's entity, and pet vet ID is the foreign key in the pet's entity. Okay, notice at this point in the small database we don't have a foreign key in our veterinarian table. That's okay. You, you're not required to have a foreign key. Some entities might not have them. Okay. Now, what this does for us, when we go here, when we go to our veterinarian, now we are related. Our first veterinarian, as you recall, did not have any. There was no number one over here, so that one shows up blank. However, if we go to Dr. Ross, there we show up with our two pets. Okay, Close this one so we can look at one more. All right. There it shows up. The foreign key has showed us that this vet ID is related to this pet ID. Okay. One last issue on keys. Please notice that I have used surrogate keys here to create my primary keys on these databases. Thank you for your attention. Hello and welcome back to the third and final segment of our video lecture for this week. If you recall, at the end of the second segment, I very briefly mentioned that we are using surrogate keys in these tables. Okay, the vet ID 
and the pet ID or surrogate keys. A surrogate key, if you recall, is a field that is added on to the table with no other purpose than to identify the rows. Okay, it has nothing to do with the rest of the information in the table. A pet ID. This pet ID has nothing to do with the pet, the owner, okay, the veterinarian. All right, so it is a surrogate key. Now, we want to talk about why we would want to use a surrogate key here. Um, when we think about what could be our candidate keys, okay, um, we want to think about the desirable characteristics of a primary key that were discussed in one of the written lectures for this week, okay. When we're looking at candidate keys, we might think about the email, okay? And the email is unique. No two are the same, okay? And so that could possibly be a candidate key. However, one of the characteristics is that a primary key needs to be stable. That means it should not ever change. And as we know, people's email addresses do change. So that sort of rules out the email address being the a good choice for the primary key. Okay. We also could use a composite key. We could possibly use the pet name and owner last name or even the pet name, the owner last name, and the owner first name if it's a very large veterinary practice and we might have a better chance of having two pet name and owner last names the same. Okay. Um, another problem comes to bear with this in that some names are fairly common. Uh, again, if you use the three fields here, it would be less likely that you would get a duplicate. However, that's getting to be a fair number of fields, and one of the characteristics is that I, we have a minimal number of attributes that we use to be the primary key. In a, in a um, composite key with three fields, we're starting to get sort of a a large number of attributes for a primary key, whereas the surrogate key obviously is just the one field. Okay. Um, another factor here is that the the owner last name, if that's part of the candidate key, again, it's something that can change. We don't want the owner's name. We don't want the primary key to change over time, and the owner's name could change. Um, if Sue Sandling is uh, Sandling is her married name. She got a divorce and decided she wanted to take her maiden name back, then that name changes. Part of our primary key would change, and this is not a desirable thing for a primary key. Um, a final thought on the using the surrogate key is that the, we like our primary keys to be factless. We like them not to contain any intelligent information, which a name obviously is intelligent information. It is a name as is an email address, okay, um, whereas the email address, again, if it would not change, might be a better choice. Um, we don't want a number, we don't want to add in, let's say, the owner's social security number as the ID. That's not factless, even though it is an ID that would be unique and it won't change and all those things, it's not factless. It is an identifier for that person. Uh, we don't want to use personally identifiable information for the primary key um, because that is a, a security risk. Um, security we'll talk about in a later um, in a later week. But um, with all these desirable characteristics of the primary key, in the instance of this pet's table here, a surrogate key. Of a of a automatically generated pet ID is really the best choice that we have. As we build our databases, these are the type of things we need to keep in mind for what we need to have as our primary key. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for your attention this week. Thank you for listening to all of these videos and reading the um, written lectures. And I hope you have a great week. Goodbye.